I'm going to talk to you about the concept of inter-individual response heterogeneity in medical rehabilitation clinical trials. What does this really mean? What we're talking about today is this reality that not all individuals enrolled in your trial will respond the same to the given intervention. I think it's very important that we discuss this and talk about ways that we can uh, learn from these inter-individual differences in how well people respond. And so that's really the topic of this discussion. One example of this would be a case in which uh, multiple individuals are prescribed an intervention to improve cardiorespiratory function. What we have demonstrated is that the response to the standardized treatment can range from a group of individuals, almost one-third of the cohort, who get very little benefit from the treatment, versus another group of individuals, about 30% of the cohort, that have an extremely robust response to the treatment. We want to understand those two extremes. What we find in most studies, particularly clinical trials, is that the entire focus is on the middle group. We look for a change in the average response. And if we see a statistically meaningful change in the average response, that leads us to say that the trial was successful. But what we ignore are those people at the two extremes. And so that variance around the mean, I think, is a very important consideration that we need to explore a little bit further. Another example is the case in which individuals are prescribed a treatment to treat muscle atrophy, to restore lost muscle mass. This is often the case in, in chronically diseased older adults as well as healthy older adults that are suffering muscle atrophy over decades. The same result occurs in which there are a group of individuals, about a third of the cohort, that don't respond all that well to the treatment, whereas there is another group of individuals on the extreme end uh, that respond incredibly well to the treatment. And what we often focus our attention on in clinical trials is whether or not the average of the entire group resulted in a meaningful change. And so we kind of focus in on that middle group, those modest responders and what their average response was, and it tells us whether or not the intervention worked or not. What we tend to ignore, though, are these two extremes, which can be quite important scientifically. When we think about the variance or that uh, range of responses that result in uh, a variance around the mean, uh, it may well be that those extremes, both on the uh, non-responder end of the spectrum as well as the extreme responder end of the spectrum, reveal important predictors First of all, why did they respond differently? Can we learn from that? Can we use that knowledge to improve the next intervention and how we design it? The bottom line is if we have a group of individuals that do not respond well to a particular intervention, can we learn from them and then develop interventions that may be more effective for them? And so we would term that precision rehabilitation. This is a great opportunity for the field, frankly to learn more about this range of responses across people and designing interventions that then target those who don't respond to the traditional form of therapy. So there are a lot of sources that underlie this response heterogeneity. We could talk about uh, things that are certainly non-modifiable sources, such as how old is the individual? Are they male or female? What is their racial or ethnic background? What is their stage of disease? In recruiting folks into a clinical trial or recruiting participants who have a particular disease condition into a trial and we want to have a diverse cohort of people, it introduces some of those variables that can actually influence whether or not they respond well. Some other things that are actually modifiable sources of this heterogeneity, things such as comorbidities. So they may have the symptomology or the disease state that is being recruited into the trial, but uh, the range of other disease conditions or other risk factors may be quite wide amongst individuals and that may influence outcomes. Another big one is their functional capacity. So if the trial is actually intended to improve function and it involves some form of effort, some physical intervention, whether it be exercise or another form of intervention, their capacity coming into the trial may well predict how well they respond. Other variables that need to be tracked and understood well, dietary modifications, medication histories, 
things that might also influence outcomes. What is their sort of daily physical activity or their weekly free living physical activity uh, profile look like? That may influence outcomes. And frankly, uh, another big one is their sleep quality. So some of the chronic diseases that we are interested in, such as Parkinson's disease and others, actually influence quality of sleep. Uh, does it matter if an individual has three hours of broken sleep a night versus eight hours of solid sleep a night? How does that impact their responsiveness to the treatment? So all of these factors, both those uh, non-modifiable factors as well as modifiable factors, determine the overall characteristics of that individual, and we call that their phenotype. We can also explore uh, more molecular predictors or uh, characteristics of that phenotype. And so uh, looking at a gene expression profile in an individual, we have used that and others have used gene expression profiling to identify prognostic indicators of who those non-responders might be and who those high responders might be. So beyond the molecular uh, potential indices that define whether or not an individual responds well to a treatment, we also have to look at other characteristics of the study design and the treatment itself. So what is the modality of the treatment? What is the prescription dose? Do we allow that to vary or is that very homogeneous in the sense that everyone gets the exact same treatment? What is the adherence or the compliance to that treatment? Uh, do we allow that to vary? or do we lock that into a very narrow uh, set of criteria? What are some other environmental or behavioral influences that might uh, determine how well someone responds? So for example, if the treatment is an exercise rehabilitation program and it involves three days per week of supervised treatment, we need to also be aware of what these individuals are doing in their free time. What if those who respond well to the treatment are also participating in their community uh, with much more free living physical activity. Maybe that has a dramatic impact on outcome versus others that come to the clinic for their treatment three days a week and, and the rest of the time are relatively sedentary. So we have to look at the big picture of all the potential factors that might influence uh, the primary outcome. Some other important considerations specifically for medical rehabilitation if we are studying a traumatic injury, such as spinal cord injury or traumatic brain injury or perhaps stroke or maybe even fracture, we need to understand the site of the injury. What's the diagnosis? How long has it been since the acute injury occurred? All of these things can influence how well an individual might respond to a treatment. If it is a chronic disease as opposed to one that is acute, uh, what is the stage of the disease? So. If it were something like Parkinson's disease where there are five well-described stages of disease, are we recruiting individuals in stage one? Are we recruiting individuals across all stages? That really uh, matters and may influence outcome. So, you know, one approach is to make your recruitment criteria very homogeneous. Get people who are in the same stage of disease. Duration of disease also has a dramatic impact on outcome, and this has been shown in studies of stroke and studies of Parkinson's and others. It matters whether an individual has been uh, dealing with the disease state for two decades versus two years. The last category that I wanted to talk about is post-surgical rehabilitation. So if an individual is enrolled in, an, in a trial to help rehabilitate them after surgery, it matters what the mode of surgery was. So for example, in the case of individuals undergoing total hip arthroplasty or hip replacement, different surgeons use different approaches to actually replace that hip joint. Does that influence outcome when it comes to rehabilitation? We need to understand that, and you need to understand the structures that are affected uh, during that surgical procedure. All right, so how can we approach this uh, from a strategy standpoint? How can we uh, try to begin to understand why not everyone enrolled in our given clinical trial responded the same. One approach is a simple uh, statistical model called k-means cluster analysis. We've used this repeatedly and others have used it as well. This enables one to identify very quickly those individuals who are at the, uh, in the two sort of extreme groups, non-responders and the, and the really, really high responders in a treatment. This allows you to begin to then probe within that group 
comparing uh, that group to the others, what is their uh, genetic profile? What is their uh, mitochondrial function look like? What are some of the molecular indices from uh, biospecimens that have been collected that might be predictive of outcome? And we also have to do, as I said before, uh, a, a very uh, detailed characterization of their behaviors outside of the intervention. How do those influence the intervention? Can we identify differences amongst the treatment groups or the responder groups in, in their daily diet? Uh, are there differences in medications and so forth? All of these things can be analyzed once the groups are classified, and we tend to use k-means cluster analysis to do that. Why is it important to uh, sort of predict this heterogeneity? And I think it's really important in the planning stages of a clinical trial. Because frankly, if we focus our attention entirely on whether or not the average, uh, whether or not the primary outcome has a mean change, and we ignore the extremes, we're missing a lot of important information. So I would say, uh, yes, it's important to consider this up front. It optimizes the trial design. It enables one to power the study to say, look, at the end of this study, I really want to have a sufficient group of individuals at the two extremes so I can really begin to understand their differences and modify treatments going forward. The other important consideration is that this just maximizes yield. So if you think about the opportunity in a clinical trial to collect secondary outcomes and to collect other uh, forms of data beyond the primary outcome. This serves the field as a whole. Uh, this provides a resource to the field. This provides the opportunity for exploratory experiments going forward. And I think it's very, very important that we consider alternate secondary outcomes, some of which would include the collection of biospecimens when possible to really offer the field an opportunity to become more precise with future interventions. I hope you will consider the importance of response heterogeneity in designing your next clinical trial, and if you need assistance with that, please contact the National Rehabilitation Research Resource to Enhance Clinical Trials at react.center.